Mother's Day. Stand up with us. We're going to worship together. Even though there's only 10 of us now, they'll all come in. Slackers. They'll join us. Let's just lift up our king together. Amen. He deserves all the glory this morning. Do you agree? Yeah. So let's just lift him up together this morning. Oh, we love you, God.
In just a moment, we're going to go to the Lord's table together and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. I just want to let you know that when you receive the elements, just hang on to them and, and we'll take communion together. Um, and that this table is open for anyone, anyone who loves the Lord. You don't have to be part of this church or, or part of any church. Um, if you love Jesus, communion is for you. So I just invite you to take part.
we read in the book of Matthew that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he ate with his disciples. He broke bread and he said, take and eat, this is my body. And so this morning, over 2,000 years later, we do the same thing. We break bread together and we remember about the body of Christ that was broken for us. Lord, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you that you came as a sacrifice for our sins, Lord God. That you came and that your body was broken on a cross, Lord for us, Lord God, for each and every person in this room, Lord, so that we could enter into a loving relationship with our Creator. And so this morning, Lord God, we just take a moment and we remember what it is that you've done for us. Church, let's eat together. Next, Jesus had some wine. And he showed it to the disciples and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so this morning, we drink together to remember that Jesus' blood was poured out for us on the cross to, to wash us white as snow. Lord, we just thank you so much for your blood, Lord God. We thank you that in your blood, Lord, that your blood washes us white as snow, Lord God. That as we stand before the Father, Lord, that we are totally clean because, what, because of what you have done on the cross, Lord God. That you came and lived a perfect life, Lord, and, and took our punishment upon yourself, Lord. And we thank you so much for it, Jesus. Church, let's drink together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we just come before you as your sons and daughters this morning, Lord God. Father, desperate for a touch from heaven, Father. I'm sure that there are people who walked in here this morning, Lord God, carrying heavy burdens, Lord. Father, that only you know about, Lord God, things that are, that are unspoken, Lord, but that they have been carrying. And so, Father, we just stand on your promise that we can take our burdens to you, Lord God, because you care for us. And so, Lord God, I just pray for each and every person in this room, each and every son and daughter of the Most High God, Lord, that you would take those burdens from them, Lord God, that you would replace them with your peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord that you would replace them with your joy, Lord. I pray for any financial burdens, Lord, that you would just um, continue to move in those situations, Lord, and, and relational problems, Father. I pray for the marriages in this room, Lord God, that they would be strengthened in Jesus' name, Lord God, that marriages would be strengthened because of you, Lord God. Father, that our eyes would be turned to you, Lord, and that our relationships would be different because of it, Lord. God, our relationships with our friends and our family, Lord, with our children, Lord, that they would be transformed because of you. And I just pray, Lord, that you would move in this place, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would have his way, Lord, that, that you would just speak through Pastor, Lord, and just open our hearts to what he has for us, Lord, what you have for us, Father. Um, and that, that our lives would be changed because of it, Father. That we would not walk out of here the same way as when we walked in, Lord. Because you have, have spoken to us, Lord God. Spoken to our hearts. We just thank you for it, Lord God. We thank you that you are a God that we can come to, Lord. Who hears our prayers, Father. Who loves his children. And we, just, we just praise you, Lord God. And we praise this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.
God this morning, amen. God is so good. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We just want to welcome you to Innovation today. How are you guys feeling? Feeling pretty good. It's really good to be together. We love to worship with you, and I'm so excited that each and every one of you decided to come to Innovation today. If you don't know me, my name is Heather. Um, and I have the privilege of just saying hello to you today. And we would actually like to give a really special welcome to anybody who's here for the first time. So if we could just welcome anybody who's here for the first time. I see some new faces. Maybe some people who haven't been here in a while. So if you haven't been here in a while or you're here for the first time, I have to get my card here because mine disappeared. Um, you green card like this. So if you turned on your flashers today, you got a VIP packet and this is in there. Um, if you didn't get a VIP packet, we have them all over the place, behind the chairs, up here in the front where I just grabbed this one from. It says connect on it. We want you to fill this out because we want to give you some free stuff. Who doesn't love free stuff? We have a free CD for you. Uh, we have um, some coupons for free coffee and snacks after the service. So we just want you to fill that out. You could take it to the VIP table, which is outside right after the service, and we'll give you all of your free things. Because we're so happy that you're here and that you decided to visit with us. Amen? Amen. Uh, and I'd really like to give a special welcome to all the mothers this morning, because it's Mother's Day. You give it up for all our moms. I told the first service, and I'll tell it again, that I every day that I'm a mom, I am more grateful for my mom. <laughs> How many of you ladies can identify? This morning, I received my Mother's Day gift from my almost three-year-old in a rather <laughs> strange place. I won't get too personal, but it's like the smallest house, smallest room in your house, you know, where the shower and the, yeah. I was in there, but he was really excited and he couldn't wait. So that's where I got my Mother's Day gift. So moms, we know you have no privacy of no life and we love you we're happy that you're here this morning and we just want to wish you a happy mother's day and we're gonna we're gonna honor you more this morning so we're just so excited each and every one of you are here i also just want to tell you guys about our serve table uh, how many of you have been to the serve table out in the lobby before some of you so our serve table just has information for you about all of our ministries here so we just want to encourage you if you've been coming to innovation for a while and you're not serving in any of our ministries, we just want to encourage you to go check it out, see where your uh, giftings and the things that you're great at could be used here at Innovation, because uh, we just love to have you involved and get connected and just be closer to the family. Amen? So check that out today, too. So good morning. We're so happy that you're here. Let's just watch this video real quick. Regret. Remorse. Pages and pages of life wasted and gone. But your story isn't finished yet. There's still time for edits and cuts. But before you start doing the right things, sometimes you need to stop doing the wrong things. My story, I decided to stop.
morning. Good morning, church. I want to invite Dave and Sarah to come right on up. Dave and Sarah Bush have participated in the Johnny and Friends weekend activity over at Spruce Lake Retreat, retreat uh, a couple different times, I think. I'm not sure how many times, two different times in the past. And so we wanted to ask them a couple of questions. You guys have been seeing videos and hearing us talk about the short-term missions trip and the opportunities we have coming up through Johnny and Friends to go for a week in June and minister to these wonderful families. And so having been there, we thought maybe you could just give us a little uh, further description of what's going on. So what has this weekend meant to you and your family? Uh, there is this crazy um, statistic out there that says that marriages who have a special needs child, there's like an 80% some odd crazy diverse divorce rate I mean it is scary and Dave and I are absolutely committed to doing this but we need support and so in addition to our everyday support circle that's what Johnny and friends is for us this is our breathing week <laughs> this is our week of respite this is our week where we know that our children are safe having the time of their lives in fact having an experience that they might not otherwise have had while we are fed spiritually we have women's groups, we have men's groups, we have together time, we have, it's just, we leave there with life changed. And of course, it has an impact on, on Zach, I'm sure, too. What is your perspective on what it means to him coming away from those weeks? Um, <clears throat> Zach, the, uh, the STMs, um, their job is to be their one child's best friend for the week, and they do an amazing job. And Zach, at 12, well, most special needs child, children have a hard time making friends, and so Zach walks away from these weeks saying, I have a new best friend! And um, it's just, it's, it's so exciting. But um, then there's also Jacob. He gets folded into this too because he gets an STM during the week. And siblings of children with special needs often get uh, uh, the shaft, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And so he gets fed, he gets to have the time of his life, he gets a best friend. And as he gets older, it, that will become all that much more important to him. But um, it's, it is vital. It has become a vital part of our lives. Well, thank you guys so very much. Go ahead and grab a seat. Listen, guys. We only have a, a short window still left to be able to sign up for this trip. It is in June. It's a week long. It's a cost of $500 to be there. That covers all of your meals. It covers room and board for that entire week. And it's local right here at Spruce Lake. It's not far. We have two people signed up so far. Uh, but this is just a great opportunity, a chance to really become a best friend to one of these kids that desperately needs a friend and just be able to love them and pour the love of Jesus into them. And so I encourage you, if you're still on the fence about it, let me know, let Joe Kroll know he's heading up the trip uh, today. Don't, don't go home without saying something to him, even if it's just an interest, if it's just a thought, well, maybe that could be cool. We want to help you. We want to get on board with you, helping you raise the funds that are needed and just make sure that we get as many people there as we can to make sure so many Zachs have an incredible, awesome week. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, I'm going to call up my dad. Pastor Charles is going to come on up here for a second as we get ready to honor the mothers. I guess I'm, I'm just going to hand it over to you. Good morning. I, I hope all of the uh, moms, you don't need to leave. You can just stay up here. You're leaving? Okay. Uh, I hope you got one of these uh, papers when you came in. All the moms... All the women have one, every woman really, not just moms of women. If you don't have one, we'll make sure you get one. We, this is written by a friend of ours, and uh, uh, we've known the family for, my goodness, uh, going on 35, 40 years. But it's just awesome. Uh, we hope you'll get a chance to read it. Uh, either uh, you already have or you will read it in the, uh, you know, during the boring parts of my sermon. Uh, but it's uh, what it does it, that's so special is that it's trying to help us to remember that on Mother's Day there's a lot of different angles, a lot of things going on, a lot of things we need to keep in mind. Uh, we're celebrating, but it's not always a celebration for everyone. For some, it brings back moments of grief and other challenges that uh, they have faced. So we, we're cognizant of that, even as we want to celebrate our moms. Uh, so we wanted you to know that. We want you to know that we appreciate you and what God is doing in your lives. Uh, I, I wish uh, Pastor Dawn was here to talk with all of you. She's in with the children here this morning uh, because she would do this so much better than I. Uh, but what I would love to do is for all of you who are moms right now, uh, if you would stand. 
we have something we want to give you. And I think we have some incredibly ambitious kids who are here somewhere. Where are the kids? Come on up here in the front. Come on, give it up for the kids. <laughs> and, and they've got gifts for you. So go ahead, if you see a mom standing, you give them one of these gifts. We wanted to give this to you. Pastor Don actually picked this out. Go ahead, guys, you, could, you can do it. You did great in the first service, you're doing great in this one. Uh, and maybe when you get it, you can go ahead and have a seat. That'll help the kids to know who has one. And uh, it, that's a book that Pastor Dawn picked out that she wanted you to have, uh, and she felt it was very uh, much a blessing to her, and so we hope and pray it'll be a blessing to you. But we also want to pray over you. Once all of these books have been given out, we're going to do that very thing. Uh, how are we doing, kids? I see a lot of moms standing. These moms have been standing a long time. They're getting tired. I don't want any moms angry at me. Got a couple more over here, over here, here in the front. Awesome. One more right here in the middle, over here. See? It's going to be, they got to maybe have to pass it along. Yeah. And we got another one. You know, we should have a very special gift for the last mom standing. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. Uh, okay, are all the moms comfortable? Good. Will all the moms stand, please? <laughs> because we want to pray over you. And what I'd like to do is if you see a mom standing, whoever is sitting, I want you to go find a mom that, uh, you know, if there's no one around them, then you be that person. Just put a hand on her shoulder, and uh, we're going to pray together. I know uh, that uh, she will appreciate that. Father, we come before you now, and we ask, Lord, that... Uh, even as we know you are the creator of all things and you do all things well, one of your greatest gifts to the human race is mothers. Uh, we all are somehow connected. We're connected through the miracle of conception and birth and growth. We're connected through the miracle of a mother's embrace and the hugs kissing the boo-boos, putting little band-aids over the scratches, and helping us when it doesn't seem that anyone else cares. Lord, we thank you for our moms. We thank you so much for our moms. We thank you as well, Lord, that you're giving them the strength. You're giving them peace. You're giving them wisdom. You're con continuing to operate through them to fulfill your sovereign plan for their lives and for their families. And Lord, in all of these things, we praise you because you do things so well. Lord, we ask your blessing upon every mom, and we thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, let's give it up for the moms. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, moms. I want to say thank you to my mom. I told her I was going to signal her out. She's not here today. She's in Virginia. My mom will turn 92 years old in June. So come on, give it up for my mom. I don't know. I don't know how many... Uh, um, grandchildren and great-grandchildren she has, but it's becoming quite a tribe, quite a, quite a large group, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I was at a, a party yesterday for one of our newest members in the family. Little Maxwell was one year old, became one year old, and we were very excited, and we're having a great party. And then uh, there was a gift given about like this uh, to, uh, and come on over, Josh, uh, Pastor Josh, and it was given to my wife, and it was, I was just sitting next to her. Everything, you know, Max would just finish opening all the gifts. He liked the one that we gave him the best. And I'm sitting right next to my wife, and, I, and, I, and she opens up this little box, and, she, and I hear her scream. I, she just screams. And I, and I thought, my first thought was, what 
could possibly have been given to her that made her so excited and so happy? Uh, because if I knew about it, I would have given it to her, you know? I didn't know about it, but this is what uh, Josh had given to her, and I, I thought maybe you'd like to. I don't know why, but... What do you mean? What do you mean you don't know why? What does you don't know why mean? We, we know exactly why. <laughs> uh, never mind, I won't say it. Oh, well, by the way, this, this will be uh, uh, number eight of our grandkids, and so we're very excited, and number three. Now, we don't know, this isn't twins, it's, no. we don't know if it's a little boy or a little girl, so that's why you had the two shoes there, I understand. Yes. I was terrified. Then Allison came home with the two shoes, a pink and a blue, and I thought, no! <laughs> but no, it's just a little bit of ambiguity there. We're not sure what's going to happen. We just found out. Allison and I, we just found out on Friday. Is it Friday? So we don't let news sit long. <laughs> so hey, why not? You guys can all start praying for us, and hopefully it'll be, oh, I don't even know. I haven't begun to think about whether it should be a boy or a girl. i to start talking to God about that. We'll see. Well, it's decided, but I don't know. Leave me alone. Okay, <laughs> let's move along. We'll move along. So thank you all so much. We covet your prayers going into pregnancy. The last two were fairly difficult for Allison with uh, weeks and weeks in bed, very, very ill. And so hopefully that will not happen. Prayerfully, we will be healthy and strong all the way through, and no work will be missed, and no anything like that. The boys will be happy. So either way, we covet your prayers. We appreciate that. Um, listen, I want to tell you just a couple things going on this week. Uh, we have MOPS happening on Tuesday, 10 a.m. The MOPS ministry, of course, is great. Allison is a part of that. For uh, mothers of preschoolers, happens every other week here at the church. F feel free to come out if you've got preschool kids. It's again Tuesday, 10 a.m. Uh, very important uh, announcement. Next week is the Pocono Marathon that happens every year here. And so I believe there's a slide coming up. We will be having one combined worship experience at 1030. That's because of all the road closures, all the difficult traffic, everything like that. We don't want to make anyone try to come out for the 9 o'clock service. So one combined service at 1030 in the morning. And we're going to have a picnic immediately after that service. So bring a side dish. Bring like the best thing you know how to make. I expect someone to bring. Well, who knows really good ribs? Who can make really good ribs? No one's volunteering? One person. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, see, you all knew better than to raise your hand. Uh, bring a side dish. We're going to provide hot dogs and drinks and things like that, but bring something on the side, baked beans, whatever it is you're famous for. We'll have a great picnic. We're also going to be doing races, so bring your running shoes, bring your dress in your, you know, running attire. That's fine. We're fairly casual as it is, but if you could be more casual, go for it. We encourage that. We'll just have one great service next week, followed by that picnic. And who would like to see me and my dad race? That'd be fun, right? I could probably challenge him here and now, right? I think the last time I challenged him to a race, his ended like this. Oh, oh, you know. And actually it was. I remember very clearly me and Nathan and you were in this parking lot. And man, he, it was not pretty. Not pretty. But maybe me and John, that's probably not fair either. I need someone to race me. What happened? Was that mean? Where, uh, he was, he's not even here anymore. He left. Oh, he's in the back. He's in the back. There he is. What do you think? We could do it? See, he says no. He's, he's embarrassed. He's afraid. So that's the Pocono Marathon. One service next week. I got to keep moving. We also have coming up in a couple of weeks on Saturday, May 23rd, an Urbane concert. Urbane is the name of a uh, local uh, gospel choir here in the area from the Pocono Mountain School District. And we're going to be hosting them here for their concert again Saturday, May 23rd, 7 o'clock. Uh, Pastor John used to be a part of that when he was in high school. And uh, Mark now has some, some connections with them. And so they're going to be here. And if you want to, come on out, show your support. It's a completely free event. Here's some great gospel music. Again, Saturday, May 23rd, 7 o'clock. And I want to just share a giving, giving scripture with you this morning from Leviticus 27, verse 30. It says that a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And we just want to remind you and thank you, of course, for your incredible faithfulness and in that everything we have is God's. 
Everything we've ever received came from God, and so we just want to give back faithfully to him. We want to be obedient to him, and so as we prepare to give, uh, I would just ask that you join me in prayer as we commit all of this money to the Lord, as well as committing uh, our local church here in the area. Uh, We're going to be praying for Life Church in Pocono Pines to the Lord, and praying for John and Wilma Hall, missionaries that we serve and that we, um, uh, what's the term? Support, thank you, support over in Nicaragua, and we've been supporting them for many years, so let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, we do thank you right now for everything that you've ever given us and every gift that you've ever provided uh, and that you are faithful to us. And in response, our heart's desire is to be faithful to you. So, Lord, I just ask that you would bless every gift given back into your kingdom, that it would be multiplied and that it would go to touching hearts, touching families, mending relationships across the Pocono Mountains. Lord God, our heart's desire is to see people come alive in you. And so take this money and make it useful to that effect. And Lord God, I pray also this morning for Life Church over in Pocono Pines. And I thank you for them, God. I thank you that there is a network of churches in the Pocono region that is diligently serving you, that is promoting the cause of Christ on this mountain. And so this morning, I pray for your blessing over them, that your favor, oh God, would rest upon them, Lord, and that they would have incredible success in ministry, seeing many souls come to know Jesus. So bless them right now. And Lord, we think of John and Wilma Hall all the way out in Nicaragua. Lord, we ask this morning, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, that they would sense your presence with them right now, that you would give them a special visitation of your Holy Spirit, a special peace, a special love, a special joy, that they would know that the people who love them and support them are praying for them in this moment. And Lord, that you would give them uh, incredible effect, incredible success in the things that you're calling them to do, that they would see people come alive in Jesus. For all of these things, Lord God, we thank you and we give you all glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many stories fill the pages of life. Some chapters you can be proud to tell. Others you would rather skip. The day life really turns a page is when you let God be the author of your story. Let God write your story and you'll live a story worth telling. My story, I decided to start. My story, I decided to start. I love that woman in the video. I don't know who she is. You know, my mom would say that's an old woman. Because to my mom, even though she's 92 years old, every older woman is an old woman. Because my mom has never aged. She's still very young thinking, and everybody who knows her knows her as young. And, uh, but she is a writer as well. Only when she writes, she's not doing the one finger on the old typewriter. She's got the modern computer stuff, and she writes stories. And they're awesome stories. I have many of them that I've read. Uh, I'm so thankful to those who help us to understand that there's a story to be known. There's a story to be written. There's a story of our lives that we can consider and think about. So that's what this series is about. It's a new four-part series entitled My Story. Uh, How many of you love a good story? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, you know, it could be on television, could be... Uh, a, a movie, but sometimes it's just someone you know that's a really good storyteller. You ever have one of those nights where everybody gets around the kitchen table and you're eating a, maybe a, some, uh, some chips or snacks or something and, and people are telling stories and me- remembering stories from the past and you're laughing until tears are coming down your face. You know what I'm talking about? There's something about how we tell stories and, and not only do we love a, a, a good story, But there are very positive stories that we've had in our lives, stories that we're really proud to tell, stories that that we look forward to being able to share with someone because we uh, are excited about our part in the story or what God was doing in and through us through the story. Unfortunately, there are also other stories that we're not too excited to tell. There are those stories that uh, we really would rather no one know about, but they're also part of our lives, and God is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But what's interesting and what I love about this series is that seemingly small 
insignificant decisions can result in life-altering uh, changes and a life-altering direction for our lives. Maybe you came to Innovation Church one day and it changed the direction of your life. Or maybe it was another church, another fellowship that you were with years ago. But something was implanted into your spirit, into your soul that changed you and you've been different ever since. Maybe you were attending a class. Maybe you're a student, high school, college, or some other training that you've had. And somehow the teacher or another student in the class or a course that you took, but something affected you and it changed you and moved you in a new direction. Maybe you got a job. Maybe it was just a job you had for a very short period of time. Maybe you only worked there six months, but during that period of time, you met someone and that person has become so significant to you. Or maybe you learned something and what you learned has become uh, absolutely essential to who you are are today. There's also seemingly small decisions that can negatively impact our lives. Have you ever said something like, boy, I wish I hadn't done that, <laughs> or I wish I hadn't started that, or I wish I hadn't got into that, or I wish I hadn't gone there, or I wish I hadn't really met that person because I've had nothing but trouble since. And you know, there are these moments, and we don't always know that we're at that crossroads, but they, but they change us and they move us in a new direction. It's been said that decisions that you made yesterday determine the story you tell today. If I was to ask about your story, it would be based on the decisions you've made in the past. But so also, decisions that you're going to make today determine the story you'll tell tomorrow. So what we're doing now and the decisions we're making and the actions that we take are incredibly significant. I remember the day some years ago, I was uh, with a friend and he was getting ready to drive to Rhode Island to check out this college. Well, I was a high school dropout, I say that from time to time, and uh, never finished high school and, and uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't, really that interested. I was attending some classes at a little local Bible type institute situation over on Long Island. That's another story and they didn't care that I hadn't graduated high school. They allowed me to attend their, attend their classes. And he was getting ready to drive to Rhode Island to look at another school like this but, but somewhat bigger and he's literally pulling out of the parking lot I had no interest in going but it was a beautiful Saturday, one of those gorgeous days like we had yesterday and he was driving a Mustang convertible. Now, I don't know about you, but that speaks to me. A Mustang convertible says something like freedom, you know, and, and let's just go for a ride. And the gas is what, 40 cents a gallon. Come on, let's do it. I mean, that's what it was back then. And so I, I, I said, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go with you. I had nothing else going on. I'm going to jump in the car. And I jumped in the car. I went with him. We drove to Rhode Island. It was about a three-hour road trip. Had a lot of fun. Uh, got to know him a little better. And, and we talked the whole way. And, and then once we were there, we got on this little campus uh, over in Rhode Island, East Providence, and uh, looked around the campus. I remember going into the auditorium. And they had this beautiful painting up beyond the stage. It was just gorgeous. And I, I sat up in the balcony, and I just sat there and, and prayed, because I was a brand new Christian. And I, I started thinking, you know what? This is a really lovely place. I, I think I'd like to go to school here. I didn't know how that would work. But so I started looking into it. Something had been triggered in me, and I started looking into what it would be like to go to school there. A few steps eventually uh, took place after that thought, and, and I had a pastor who was willing to write a letter of introduction to the president of the school and say, you know, you should uh, let this kid come to your fall classes, and they said yes, and I was I accepted into this school. Uh, they, they assumed, I guess, I had a high school diploma because uh, the little place I was going to probably should have asked me about that. So I transferred over. Again, the, the high school diploma never happened. That's another story. But I'm in school, and now I'm in this, this new college. And within a week or so, I'm going with a friend uh, to uh, a, one of her new classes. I just signed up for the class. I thought, 
uh, you know, this would be a, a great class for me to take, along with a few others that I was taking that semester. And I sat down and was looking around at all these new students, and I was really excited. I'm 23 years old. A lot of these students are, you know, 18, 19 years old in this class, and I'm feeling a little old, I suppose, but I was so excited to be there. Look behind me, about five rows back and to the left, I made eye contact with a young lady who smiled, I think, but um, my heart did a little, you know, leap, and I, I, I didn't think much more about it after that. <clears throat> but later that night, uh, I went with another friend to what they called the fellowship hall, a fellowship area. You know, you could get some hamburgers, hang out with other students, you know, like a student union building. We didn't call it that, but that's basically what it was. And I went in there, my friend went one way, and I looked another way, and there was that young girl from the class. And I walked over to her, and I introduced myself, which was pretty forward. I, I, I don't know why I did that, but I just did. Maybe she, we made eye contact. I don't know. She was a beautiful young girl. And I, I walked over, and I, I said, hi. <laughs> yeah, it was just as sleazy as that. Hi. And, and, and she was so sweet, and, and she was nice to me, you know, which was great. And, uh, I, and I said, you know, we talked a little bit. I introduced myself. And, and she didn't talk a whole lot at first, but she was getting ready. She had, she had to leave, go back to the dorm. I said, well, can I walk you to the dorm? She said, sure. On the way back to the dorm, uh, I, she told me, well, you know, she had a boyfriend. And I, I, you know, it didn't even bother me. I looked at her and I said, well, you know what? You should really dump him and go out with me. <laughs> I mean, it just came out of my mouth so quick. No, no kidding, no kidding. And, and, and the reality is, she dumped him, started going out with me, and she's been my wife ever since. That's Pastor Dawn. That's who I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, but what's cool about that is I got into the, the Mustang convertible on a whim. I didn't know that that was going to change my life. Not only was I going to go to the school, but I was going to meet my life partner. We're talking about all the grandchildren we have now, and, and the two more on the way. We're so excited and blessed and thankful. Sometimes our lives pivot on very small decisions. Isn't that true? And this was just one of those moments for me. And so what I want to ask throughout this series is how do we live the story we want to tell? How do we live the story we want to tell? How do we live a story that's worth telling? And I will suggest that one way to make sure that happens is to ask God to help write the story. You know, there's a passage in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The author. He's the author of your life. He's moving you forward. The Holy Spirit is writing. You're literally the writing of the Holy Spirit as your life is being written out by God. But we have to then ask ourselves, how do we live a story that's worth telling? And that's what this series is about. For the next four weeks, we're going to make four decisions. The first one today, I'll talk about start. And that is start a discipline that will help us tell the story God wants us to tell. I'll come back to that in a moment. Next week, we're going to talk about stop. And that is to stop behaviors or mindsets or attitudes that hinder the story that God wants you to tell. And then in the third week, we're going to talk about stay. Stay when it would be easier to go. Sometimes we, we quit a little too quickly, right before something good is about to happen. And then in the final message, we're going to talk about go. That is when it would have been easier to stay. At some point, you may need to take a step of faith and leave what is comfortable to honor God. So today, I want to talk with you about starting a, a life altering disciplines and habits that help us to tell the story that God wants us to tell. Let me just give one caution. I'm not talking here today about following our dreams and, and starting a business or, or writing the great American novel or launching a ministry. Or, and we're going to do all of that in week four under the message entitled, Go. Today, I'm simply talking about getting started with the small decisions that we make that often lead to large life changes. Uh, there's an author I'm familiar with, and he has a concept that he calls keystone habits. K 
keystone habits. It's that one thing that you do that then cascades forward into other positive habits. And we've all experienced this in one form in our lives, whether we were aware of it at the time. And the absence of that kind of keystone habit would then be the absence of those other potentially positive habits. For example, maybe one day you decided to work out every morning. Some of you do that. And you start your day and you do a little exercise or you go for a walk and it, and it invigorates you and it changes you a little bit because then during the day, once you created that habit, maybe you eat a little differently. You don't eat quite as much junk food because you had that walk and you did that little bit of exercise and you don't want to put junk food into your body and nullify what you just did. And, and then since you're doing this on a regular basis, maybe you're eating a little bit more healthy food and, and, and then you're getting to sleep a little better. You're getting a better night's sleep because you've created this habit and then the next day, uh, you're, you're a little clearer in your thought processes, able to think a little more clearly, make decisions and take actions a little bit more definitively. Now, you know, all of it started with one keystone habit. You made a decision to get up in the morning and work out a little bit and it cascaded into other good decisions or positive results based on the one thing you did. A lot of life is like that. Some of you may have experienced exactly what I've just described, or you've experienced it in other ways. And so that's really what this is all about. How do we go about this? And it's not just about our physical health, that's just an illustration. I want to also speak about our spiritual health, the spiritual habit, the decisions we make that help us move forward with God. And so to do that, I wanted to illustrate with a biblical story. And what I want to do with this story is I want to tell you the story behind the story. So if you're taking notes, we've finally gotten to them. The story behind the story. Some of you are familiar with the story of Daniel. How many of you heard the story of Daniel and the lion's den? Okay, because some of us, we heard it even when we were children. And he went into the lion's den. And he was put in there by an evil king. And, uh, you know, the lion's mouths were shut by the angels. And uh, he w survived all night and came out the next day. Uh, and the king realized what he had done was wrong and that God was right uh, operating through Daniel. And, uh, and it changed things. It changed not only Daniel's life, but changed the nation. We usually get that part. But there was a story behind the story. The king in, 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 that we're speaking of here, his name is Darius. And he had a government to run. And he ran it through what he called satraps, 120 satraps. They were governors, if you will, to help rule the kingdom. Daniel had actually been taken in battle when he was a young boy when the Babylonians had conquered Judah and destroyed Jerusalem and even the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the temple uh, that Solomon had built and carried away the plunder. And so Daniel had now grown up in Babylon, but God had raised him up. And he is now functioning as a grown man and as one of the satraps, one of the governors ruling over the kingdom uh, because uh, the Jews lived there for 70 years until they were released and were able to come back to the land. So an entire generation lived outside of Israel. But Daniel stood out. You see, this is what is so important for us to recognize. He stood out even beyond the other satraps and got put in charge of more and more responsibilities. And you know what happens when you do that? Not only do you get promoted, but you make other people jealous, petty people. And there's a lot of petty people in politics and in government positions and even in religion at times. There's, there are people who are just small-minded. And, and these people became very angry at Daniel's success. And so we join the story in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. Boy, it sounds like CNN or Fox News in political season, right? Who's going after who? But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. 
So they're going to go after him based on his faith, based on his relationship with Yahweh, based on being a Jew, rather than anything that has to do with his character or his integrity or his political abilities, his skills as an administrator, as a satrap, as a governor. They're going to go after him in a way uh, that would be very underhanded, but they're going to find some way to take him down. And so they come up with a plan. And the plan is to make it impossible, and they bring this plan to the king, and they say, King, we, want him, we think it should be impossible for anyone for a season to pray to any other god, only to the king. And we'll have a great statue of you, and people will pray only to you. And, you know, this will rally the country together. We'll have, we'll have uh, uh, people all supporting you and, uh, and, and, and uh, your, your purpose, your vision for the country. And it'll be a good thing, and everybody needs to get behind it. And the king, of course, uh, what, what man doesn't want to have a little arrogance here, a little pride, say, well, you know, it sounds like a good thing to me. Build your statue, and everyone will just have to bow down and pray to me for a season. Now, keep in mind, here's a man, Daniel, who had been promoted. He's without corruption. He's trustworthy. He hasn't been negligent in any, even the slightest detail of the responsibilities that have been entrusted to him. But here's what happens. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. That is, towards his homeland where he used to be. There, three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. Now listen to this last line just as he had done before, just as he had done before. He didn't change his pattern. What was his pattern? His pattern was to pray three times a day, morning, noon, and night. This is what he had always done, and he was not going to allow fear to stop him. This is his keystone habit. This is what he does that centers his life. This is what he does to align himself with God. He's going to align himself with God in the morning, and then as the challenges of his responsibilities continue, he's going to align himself with God again in the afternoon to make sure he's centered in the wisdom of God. And as the challenges continue throughout the, the day, he's going to align himself again with God in the evening so that he's ready for his home responsibilities or other challenges that may start still come. This is his keystone habit. This is what he does that everything else flows out of. And why is this successful? Because it's the initial habit which formed really the, the foundation of his entire life story. So ultimately, as you may know, and that's the story behind the story, the rest of the story is he gets arrested uh, for doing so. He gets thrown into the lion's den. The lions don't eat him. He comes out bigger than he was before he went in. In fact, some of the people who had falsely accused him, they got thrown into the lions, and Daniel became one of the most powerful men of that generation, and the story continues from there. God protected him. But there's that story behind the story that focuses our hearts and our minds and our thoughts on the task at hand, and it leads me to two questions, and here's the first, and we'll put it on the screen. What does God want you to want? an interesting question, isn't it? What does God want you to want? And you have to look at it from this perspective. Five or ten years from now, who will you be? What story does God want you to be able to tell five years from now, ten years from now? What will be your story that you're telling to your neighbors or your friends or your co-workers or your sons or your daughters uh, or family members. What will your story be? What does God want you to want? Maybe five years from now, you'll be able to tell someone, well, you know, we're in financial freedom today. But five years ago, we were in deep debt, and we learned how to do a financial, uh, how to do a snowball, 
a, a, a debt snowball to get rid of our debt. We learned how to, uh, how to do savings, how to get our budget in order. We learned a little bit about investing. Uh, we, we made some changes, uh, and all of those small changes ultimately led to the financial freedom we have today. But that's a story that you may have five years from now based on some decision you make today or in the very near future. Maybe your, maybe your story five, ten years from now from now, we'll, you'll be able to say to somebody, well, you know, sometimes you just need to have right priorities. You know, I was just like you. Everything was work. I was obsessed with my job and trying to make as much money as I could. I thought I was being a good father or a good mother. Or I was doing, you know, whatever I thought had to be done uh, to make ends meet, but somehow I wasn't there for my kids. I, I wasn't there to be the influence. I wasn't there to speak into their lives and to demonstrate the integrity and the character that God wanted them to see in and through me. So I had to make some decisions. I had to get my priorities straight. And here I am 10 years later, and my kids are, uh, and I have great relationships, and uh, we may not have everything we'd like to have, but we've got the family because the priorities are straight. Or maybe you might say five, ten years from now, uh, you know, I, I barely knew what I wanted to do. I was a Christian, but I, I didn't, wasn't really doing anything as a Christian. But I wanted to have a spiritual family. I wanted to know that my family would grow spiritually, and I had to make some decisions as how I was going to live, what my, my husband and I, or what my wife and I were going to do, how we were going to lay out our day, whether we, we were going to align ourselves with God, and how were we going to do that. We had to make those decisions, what we were going to do with God's word, what we were going to do with God's people. And ultimately, our children began to see that we were the same people in the house as we were when we went to church together on Sunday mornings or any other activities during the week because there is a consistency to our lives and today 10 years later we've got a spiritual family we've got people who our kids are growing and they're, and they're not rebelling against us well but we had to make some decisions to see that happen or maybe you'd be the person who uh, you know five ten years from now you say well you know I used to be 20 30 pounds overweight or 40 pounds overweight or whatever it may be uh, but but you know I talked with some people and 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 they helped me I'm in better shape today uh, I maybe this is more the story that I told earlier of the person who started working out a little bit in the morning uh, maybe got some friends to have accountability it affected the diet and affected the lifestyle and the sleeping patterns and all the rest of the things that we've been talking about this is a person who gave Nikki Gurnitz a call and it changed it changed your life because you called the right person if you don't know who that is you call me and I'll get you in touch with her uh, so sometimes it's just a simple decision one little thing that you do that makes such a huge difference in your life so based on what you believe God wants you to want you start thinking through well who is it that I want to be now the second question is like this what do you need to start what do you need to start because sometimes <laughs> it's getting started that's the hardest thing isn't it what's the old saying every journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step right and and, and we don't take that first step so I get it I understand that but what story do you want to be able to tell five years from now or ten years from now one thing I'll say to you is this Choose one thing. Choose one thing or you won't choose anything. Because what happens for some of us, and I know I'm this way, is if I'm going to make a change, I choose everything at once. I'll have, I'll have five or ten things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix everything. I'm going to do it all this week. I'm going to have it done before Tuesday. And, and then I'll tell you about it five, ten years from now, how everything's changed. And it never happens. It goes right, away, right along with New Year's resolutions. Never, but how about one thing? How about a small step that can lead to larger steps? What would that one thing be? Choose one thing, or you probably won't choose 
anything. You know, I've made some decisions in my life, speaking of spiritual things that you didn't really think of as spiritual at the time, uh, but God ultimately showed that they were the steps along a progress or a process that led me to living a life that I, I'm thankful for and, I'm, and, I'm, and I rejoice in. And I, it's not a perfect life. I'm not a perfect person, but I've been able to walk with the Lord and see his hand upon my home and my family and so many friends and the body of believers I've been a part of and the way the world has the way the Lord has blessed me as I've been in different places around the world. I've been very thankful for that. And sometimes there's these little decisions that happen. It's a long story. I'm not going to get into all of it. But there was a time uh, right before I came to know Christ. I was 23 years old uh, and uh, 1975, so you can do the math. And, uh, and I was on my way to a, a studio in, in uh, London, England. Uh, it was Pebble Beach Studios, and uh, I'd been invited. I'd sent them a demo of my playing. I used to play drums. I'd been on the road for many years at that point, but I was in between bands, and I thought, maybe I'll try something new. And I sent a demo. I had a friend over there who, uh, show, who played the demo for them, and they said, well, tell them to come over. Tell them to come over. I said, okay, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go over there. And from the decision that I made, to the, the day I was going to leave, in between that moment, I came to know Christ. Now, I had not been anticipating that. I didn't know I was going to become a Christian. I was not a religious person. I'm not really a religious person today. I'm a follower of Christ, which is a different thing. But I had no clue about what was going to happen and how God was about to shake my world, which is what he did. And in the process, I came to know Jesus as Savior. And uh, that's a story some of you have heard, and I'll, I'll save it for another day. Uh, but now I, I had to make a decision, and so I thought, I wonder if they have a school like this over in England, because I'm going to England, you know, for the, to be in this studio. And so I heard about a little school here in, well, in Long Island, not Pennsylvania, but at the time I lived in New York, a little school, and I, I called them and I said, uh, can I talk to you? I'd like to know if there are little schools like this that teach the Bible and Bible courses and little Bible institute type places. You know, and do you have those in England? He said, I can't talk to you right now, but if you'll come by on Saturday, uh, I'll spend some time and I'll, I'll tell you whatever I can. Anyhow, it's a long story, but there I am Saturday trying, because I'm leaving in a few days, and uh, there are a lot of kids there. When I say kids, I mean 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. I was only 23, but, you know, sometimes it's not the years, but the mileage, you know? And, and they just seemed like little kids to me, and, uh, but they were Christians, and really this was some of the first Christian fellowship I had. They're excited, they're pumped up, they're talking about Jesus, they're going to go to this school. I said, well, that's great, that's great, but I, I couldn't seem to get into the guy I wanted to talk with. Eventually, they let me in, and he started putting uh, books in front of me. Oh, well, you'll sign up for the first semester, you'll have the book of Romans you'll be studying, also the book of Hebrews you'll be studying. I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I'm the guy that called you to ask you if you had schools like this over in England. I assume if you run a school like this, you know where they are in other places around the world. And he looked at me and said, I'm sorry, uh, son, I really can't help you with that. I don't know uh, what schools are over in England right now, but today is registration day and you've been standing online to register. I didn't even know that, that tells you something. Uh, and so they didn't ask me about my high school diploma or any kind of education I had. I looked at the books and I started getting excited. I said, yeah, I could study that, I could study that. I have enough money to go. I, uh, wow. I registered and I started school on Monday. Now, that was a life change. It didn't seem like much. But everything changed based on that one decision. Now, I will look back at, I eventually did get to London, military paid my way later on when I was a Navy chaplain. Uh, uh, but that Pebble Beach Studios became the center of what became known back then as the punk rock movement. You have to be a little older to remember who people like Johnny Rotten and Sid Vicious and uh, this kind of crazy stuff was going on. I would have been the studio drummer for those guys. As a brand new Christian, and just getting out of drug addiction. So you have to wonder if God did not rescue me. 
okay? I, I'm not going to read too much into it, but I know that, that my life changed. I ended up in this little school, and things went from that point on. It's just a simple story, but it's a story that I'm glad that I can tell my kids about. All of my children know this story. They've heard it. Maybe they tell a few others. You know, this, here's what happened to my dad once, and I'm just thankful that I have a story that I can tell that shows God's hand in my life. And so the question is, do you have that story? And is it growing? What's the story that's being written today that you're going to be able to tell five years from now or 10 years from now? What do you need to start? What does your story need to start with? You know, I, I'm a counselor. Some of you know that. Uh, and, uh, and we have Celebrate Recovery here. Uh, at innovation. Maybe you're wrestling with insecurities or various addictions or codependency, codependency, the kinds of things that we all wrestle with from one time or another. Maybe you're just a workaholic and you don't know how to shut down. Maybe it's time to talk to someone or get, in, in, get into one of the step studies or get into... It's a decision. It might seem like a small one, but it could change the course of your life. Maybe you're saying, well, you know, I really don't know anything about the Bible. Maybe, maybe you get one of those plans, a read through the Bible in one year plan, or read through the New Testament in three months plan. And you can get them online. They're everywhere. You don't have to pay for them. You just choose to do it. Maybe you might be thinking, well, how do I start? You know, our marriage is struggling. It's been struggling for a while. Well, how about going on a date from time to time? And you date your spouse just like when you first met. And how about praying together every day? There's a couple of things you could do that would make a huge difference that might move you in a new direction. Say, well, I haven't really learned how to depend on God the way I want to depend on God. Well, maybe you take a day where you fast. You say, I'm going to fast breakfast and lunch, and instead during those times and during those moments, I'm going to align myself with God. I'm going to take that moment where I would have been eating. I'm going to align myself with God. I'm going to make sure that God knows it, that I know it, uh, and that the enemy knows it. And I want, to make, I want to show and reveal that I'm depending more on God. And maybe you do that from time to time. People are wrestling with all manner of issues. Maybe you say, I just want to grow spiritually. And, you know, we, we've talked about our life groups uh, that we have. Uh, maybe you go to the bait course or you, or, you, or you go to starting point or you get into one of our, our uh, community groups and you, you get connected or you come out to my class that I'm teaching or there's various things you can do. Or you, maybe you just start attending um, fellowship regularly, either here or somewhere. Uh, wherever you may be from, maybe you're not from this area, but maybe this is the time. We've got people with us online from uh, all around the world. Maybe this is the moment to dig in and say, you know, I, I need to get to know some people and I'm going to make that decision. I'm going to make that change. You know, I have folks who say to me, I just want to grow as a leader. I want to grow as a husband. I want to grow as a wife. And sometimes I'll say, well, maybe you need to find a mentor. Find someone who's been there and done that just a little bit ahead of you that you can spend a little time with and be accountable with and learn from and grow from and be encouraged by. Uh, many of, I've had many wonderful mentors and I've mentored others. And we have a lot of men and women here that are, are willing to love and encourage and support you on your journey. I've had people say to me in counseling, I just can't get my thoughts together. They go, they go, they go, they go, they go. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if that's you, but it happens to some of us. And I'll say, well, why don't you start journaling? Get yourself a nice journal, grab your quill, you know, your pen, and write one sentence about who you are today. And then maybe read a scripture, maybe start in a book of the Bible. Maybe, uh, maybe you could start with one of Paul's letters. Maybe take the letter of Philippians. It's a lovely letter that he wrote. Read a little bit and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Write a little of that. And then put a date on it and put it away. Tomorrow, take it out. Write a little bit more about what's going on in your life. Read the next couple of verses. What's God saying to you? Write that down. Date it. Put it away. And you start journaling your life. You're starting to, if you will, get your thoughts together, organizing your thoughts along with God. I mentioned earlier it might be time for some of you to get your finances in order. We have, even on our website, a course that you can go through 
but we also are very familiar with Dave Ramsey's materials, uh, which are online or can be taken here. Uh, we have uh, another course that we offer here called I Was Broke and Now I'm Not. <laughs> Does that resonate with you? Maybe that's for you. Maybe a decision needs to be made in that area. Maybe it's uh, to get into better shape. We were talking about that earlier, having an accountability partner in that way. Whatever it may be, how are you going to start? What is it that God wants you to start, and how are you going to start? I'm going to ask the band to come on up as we finish up. And the question I started out with is this. What story do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? Because the decision you make today is going to determine the story you'll tell tomorrow. With that in mind, I'm thinking of something from the Old Testament uh, with a king named Ahab. We find this story, and it's not something brand new. I just want to mention it before we finish uh, because it comes straight to the point of what I was trying to share with you today. And it's 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 13. We'll put it on the screen. Listen to this. Meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and announced, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this vast army? I will give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. So the king is being told he's going to have this great military victory. But who will do this, asked Ahab. And the prophet replied, this is what the Lord says. The young officers of the provincial commanders will do it. Now listen to uh, what the king asks next. It's a very interesting question. And who will start the battle, he asked. And the prophet answered, what? You will. <laughs> who will start the battle? The prophet looks at Ahab and says, you will. You will. <laughs> I think Daniel understood this. When Daniel... Uh, of course, it's a different story, but when he aligned himself with God three times a day, he was basically saying, I'm going to start the battle. You know, if the other satraps have a hard time with this or this ends up getting me thrown into a, a prison, I'm going to start the battle. This is a decision I made. I'm going to do what I've done in the past to honor God and to trust the Lord with all my heart, not lean on my own understanding of this situation, but I'm going to acknowledge God in everything I do, and I know he'll make my path straight, whatever happens next. And so Daniel made his decision. But Ahab also had a decision to make, as do you, as do I. So let me tell you one more time. What story do you want to tell? You want a good marriage. Well, what decision needs to be made now? Spiritually grounded kids. Okay, what needs to happen? You want to have a growing ministry, a way of serving God. Okay, what's next? These things do not happen by accident. They're, they're started, uh, they're usually very small disciplines, small steps that make up ultimately a much larger story, your story, your life. And who's going to start the story? Who's going to start the battle? Look at someone and say, you will. <laughs> That's right. Look at me and say, you will. Thank you. That's right. I'm the one that has to make the decision. It starts here. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? This is the decision. There are moments, there are those pivotal moments that change the direction of your life. You have to decide today the story that you want to tell tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've had here today. What a time it has been. We are so grateful. Again, Lord, we thank you for all the moms on Mother's Day that you would continue to honor them and bless them and strengthen them for the task at hand and the challenges they face. Give them the wisdom to meet the needs of each day. But Lord, for all of us, help us to know that today we're making decisions that will impact the story we'll tell tomorrow. And Father, I want that to be a great story, one that we can give to our children and that our children will be able to tell their children and on and on should you tarry, Lord, until you return. That through the generation that comes forth from us, stories will be told around kitchen tables, dining rooms, maybe even campfires, that 
Things happened that God moved based on small decisions, but here's what happened, and we tell the story, and it gets passed along. Lord, let our lives be this story, and let the things we do today begin the process. Lord, what is it you want us to start, and how are we going to start, and when are we going to start? Lord, I'm reminded again of what the prophet said to the king. You will. You will do this. You will. That means you can. That means God will empower you. That means God will pour his strength into you. And it's just a small thing, but it's going to lead to bigger things. And your story is being written. Right now, if that's you today, every eye is closed. Uh, every every, every uh, head is bowed. Uh, just between you and God, if that's you and you're saying, Lord, I want you to help me to write the story that you've laid out for me, that you are the author of my life, if that's you, just raise your hands. Every person I would say, God, I want, you, I want my story to be the story that you're writing through me. Go ahead and raise your hands. Everybody who's saying, I, I want my life to be your story. Praise God. Say, I will start the battle. Say, Lord, I want to tell the story. Go ahead. Go ahead. Five years from now, ten years from now, the story will be told because of the decision that will come today, tomorrow, in the weeks ahead. Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. First, a small change where you just simply say to the Lord, I will. Now, for some of you, your story is about to change in an even more dramatic way because this is the moment where you say yes to the Lord. This is the moment where you stop running. This is the moment where you stop playing church. This is the moment where you get real. This is the moment where you say to God, take my heart. This is the moment where you say, all that I am is yours, Father. This is the moment that you've been waiting for all of your life. And God is ready to receive you as his child. And if you're ready to take that step, it's a step that will change you from this point on. I want you to pray with me. We're going to talk to God. And I want you to say, Father, I give my life to you. What a great way to start. Pray it with me. Father, I give my life to you. I receive your son, Jesus, as my Savior for the forgiveness of my sin, that I may start a new life with you. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to breathe upon me and fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might live with you from this day forward that you would be my father and I would be your child that I might learn at the feet of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would work through me to make a difference in my generation and that the day will come when the testimony of my life, the story of my life, will not be something I'm ashamed of and will not reveal simple regrets, but will reveal this decision being made right now, this moment. Your amazing grace changing me forever. I thank you for it, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to worship the Lord.
Listen, real quick, just before we go, if uh, you happen to be here and you prayed that prayer with Pastor a moment ago and you dedicated your life to the Lord for the first time or maybe the first time in a very long time, I would encourage you to look to the back of the chair in front of you and find this little decision card that just asks for your name on it, but it says that I've made a decision today to follow Jesus Christ and I would like more information. It's very, very simple. There's nothing overly special about it. It's just a first step. It's everything we've been talking about this morning. It's that one thing to start that could lead to an entirely different life, to an entirely different landscape of what it looks like your days. And so I'd encourage you to do that, to take that card, write your name on it, take it to the Welcome Center. We want to help you take that first step. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for this amazing church, for all these incredible people that you've gathered here. And Lord, right now, as we prepare to leave, I just pray your blessing over them. Lord God, that they would go full in the power of the Holy Spirit, that as they live out their days throughout the rest of this week, oh God, that you would be with them, that you would call to remembrance the things that we've heard today. Lord, that we would actively and intentionally live our lives starting, Lord God, with the end in mind, that we'd be living now for the things you're calling us to. And Lord, so continue to move, upon, move among them, move upon them, give them traveling safeties and mercy as we go. And Lord, again, we just thank you for who you are, your incredible love and for calling us your sons and your daughters. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.